whatever was going on with the virgins is similar to what's happening here with the talents. So we can start to get a picture, I hope you're starting to see, that what they did is what filled the lamp, okay? It wasn't something that you could actually buy, really. In other words, did you actually go and do the work? The guy took five and he did something with it to make five more. Took two and did something with it to get two more. So whatever this is picturing the kingdom is about what the Father gives us. What do you do with it? That's why it's well done, good and trustworthy servant. What are you doing with these things, right? Well done, good and trustworthy servant. Enter into the joy of the master. The joy of the master has to do with everlasting life. See, again, if you read the whole context, we can start to go, well, because what is the joy of the master? Well, he's telling you, those that had their lamps full, they're getting the everlasting life. Those that did not, were going to get the punishment. Those who, you know, did something with the talents they were given, were going to get the everlasting life. Those who didn't, were going to get the punishment. The relationship that gets you the everlasting life is one of doing my expectation. I expected you to feed me or my brethren, give drink or my brethren, okay, visit, take care of, serve the brethren, because that's how you serve me. Because a lot of people say, oh, I just serve Messiah by yourself doing nothing for anybody else. How does that really work? Because we're talking about being a good and trustworthy servant. Oh, yes, I serve Messiah. How? He doesn't need anything. But he wants you to be an extension, his arm. He wants you to be an extension of him. So through you, he can do. You're going to be arms and legs and you know, strong back or whatever it is, or you're going to be a mouth and you're going to speak comforting words. Or whatever. You're going to extend from him. And see, one came and said to him, good teacher, what good shall I do to have everlasting life? Okay, can we not see immediately, and by the way, this is previous to chapter 25, there's a connection between good and everlasting life. It's not just everlasting life, just believe in Yeshua. I mean, like, like that he exists and did whatever he did, right? Just, to, just believe that. No, there's good to be done here. Because he says very clearly, good teacher, what good shall I do to have everlasting life. And Yeshua said, you're an idiot. There's nothing to do. I die and I give you the whole thing and there's nothing more for you to do. No, he doesn't say that, does he? Because for all of you who are learning from Christianity side of this, you do have to do. Instead of being told, oh no, if you try to do, you're making a mockery. No, not doing makes a mockery. Now, he wasn't asking if I have to do commandments. He was just told he needed to. So he's like, well, uh, which ones? Because I only want to do the ones I have to do. Um, I don't know. He could have said, remember Sinai when he said, if you agree to do everything I say? That's, that's it right there. Do everything he says. That's the covenant. Do everything. It's all still valid. Now, there are some things, let's be clear, that you can't do because there are things you need to be in place to do them. So to do them would be wrong now. You can't do the things that we needed a temple for without a temple. So you can't do them, all right? Certain things were jurisdictional. Like you can't do certain things in terms of like stoning people without being in the land with a judicial system that is scriptural judicial system to apply those laws. So you can't just go out there and stone somebody. His particular problem was that he had a problem with stuff. He liked stuff. So Yeshua threw that little piece in the middle there for him personally. So it's not a commandment for all of us to sell everything and be impoverished, monks or whatever, you know, with a, a vow of poverty. Because it says in the next verse, it says, and the young man heard the word and went away sad because he had a lot of stuff. That wasn't just that he had a lot of stuff. He was emotionally attached to his stuff, okay? If you're not attached to your stuff, you would just give it away if you needed to give it away. You, if, if, if the person, like it says, if they, you know, if they, they wanted your garment, you give them also your, you know, the other garment too, okay? Because you're not attached to it. 
He says, and when the Stolans heard this, verse 25, they were astonished, saying, well, then who was able to be saved? Now, they're connecting saved with kingdom entrance. But remember, kingdom entrance then and salvation is being linked by Yeshua to works. Don't miss that point. Everything he's been saying to this man who asked the question is, things to do. What do I need to do? He didn't say nothing, just believe in me. Okay? He said, do these things and come and follow me. Be in the same way I am. Do what I do. So step one, fear him. Step two, walk in his ways. We realize that he loves us, and guess what we do in response to that? We respond by loving him. Christianity wants you to have this emotional love for him first. Why would we start there? You know, a lot of you did that when you were a kid. You fell in love with somebody. It was like this, thing, you know, this, you know, infatuation thing. And you didn't even hardly know the person. But you just got starstruck or love struck or whatever they call it, right? And then you got to know them and realized that wasn't what I thought they were. And they, that's not what I, but you're so, you know, rose colored glasses and the whole thing. He wants us to fall in love with him. Step three. And this is the only place Yeshua mentions grace. In this gospel, <laughs> no place else. So for all you Christians who think grace is the whole thing, why didn't Yeshua ever talk about it? Okay? He didn't talk about it. This is the only place, and it's not, it's not even talking about anything that you normally think grace is. It's not talking about somebody that's all screwed up and they're going to receive favor even though they don't deserve it. This is literally saying, if you do what's easy and expected to do, why do you expect any credit for that? It's easy to love somebody who loves you. It's easy to do good to somebody who does good to you. That doesn't get you any credit for that. You don't score any points for that is what he's saying. Oh, no, grace isn't about scoring points. Yes, it is. Go listen to the teaching. This is literally that same word. Go in your King James. It says grace here. Yeshua says... Very clearly, a taught one is not above his teacher, but everyone perfected shall be like his teacher. That's called discipleship. Okay, discipleship is you becoming like your teacher. So when Paul and the other apostles were out there doing, people that they were discipling were learning to be like Peter, like James, whoever their teacher was, like Paul, who was imitating their teacher, Yeshua who was imitating his teacher, the Father, okay? So if I'm your teacher, especially if you think that you want to teach someday, you better figure out how to sound like me, okay? I don't mean personality-wise, information-wise, the message. Because if you read the four Gospels, they have a very, very different tone with the same message. 